Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this new episode of the Mindful Steward podcast. I just finished interviewing one of my best friends, Andrew Whiten. So Andy is... I don't know how else to describe him besides just this really creative genius who really thinks outside the box. He's always been a really good influence on on me by kind of showing me that there are different ways to look at everything and different experiences that you can have in your life than what everyone tells you you're supposed to do. He's kind of been the guy to open my eyes to a lot of things. He brought me on my first big backpacking adventure, which I would say kind of changed my life. But To go a little further back, he was somebody who I met through the snowboard world. Him and I were obsessed with it. Um, We were making a lot of videos, and eventually I went and did something else, and he continued with the video side of things, and now he's a really successful videographer. He's doing quite well running his own business, and he has a lot of freedom doing so, and I just wanted to talk to him about that, how that came to be, and also about some of the humanitarian work that he is doing. He is right now the media director for a charity called CDAS International. CDAS is an organization that is helping to feed and bring water to huge amounts of people in South Sudan. Uh, If you do not know what is going on in South Sudan, it's one of the most war-torn places on earth, um, one of the most dangerous places on earth. One of the places on earth where people need the most help and also one of the places on earth where there is so much opportunity for things to change for the better. And Andy is doing huge things. He's been flying over there to create video content for this organization. Um, He's very emotionally invested in it. And I've really been kind of fueled by seeing his passion for this project um, kind of grow and grow and seeing him get more involved and... I think everyone should kind of check it out. He has a video that he created to bring awareness to some of the issues there. I'm going to throw that in the link. Please give that a watch. It's really eye-opening. It demonstrates and kind of shows you what people are going through there in quite an accurate depiction. So check that out. And again, as always, if you are interested in meditation or mindfulness in general, check out themindfulsteward.com. I have some professionally recorded guided meditations from a well-renowned meditation coach, Michelle Pound. She's a good friend of mine. I have another episode with her, but they're awesome. And you'll also get a couple eBooks that I created around mindfulness. So without further ado, I will get this episode started. Thank you so much for tuning in. That's all you need. Think of like all the best skate videos. They were always the VH1 or whatever, like the VHS or what was like, no, what what was the one camera? DV. Not the DVX. uh, There was like that VX1. Oh, yeah. And it was like this shit camera that skaters used. But they just... And it was like... Like slapped all the best, And all the best videos were always shot on that. Yeah. And like, it doesn't matter what you use at all. (laughs) Like when we used to make our snowboard videos, it was the GL2. But that was good at that point in time, it was wasn't kinda, it? Yeah, it was kind of chill. It was like $1,600 camera. And then the next thing we got was DVX and then HVX. And the HVX was like to keep up. Because I was like, I want to be like Eddie Grahams. <laughs> <laughs> wonder what happened to that guy. Uh, he you got kind of know, don't you? He got into like fashion videography and stuff in New York City. He moved to New York City. Oh, wow. Andrea uh, knew him. And when we went on a trip to Costa Rica... We stopped in New York City and met with him for pizza. Okay, I remember that now. Yeah, it was I remember you talking about super that. Super trippy, and uh, we got pizza, and I was like, "Man, I've watched your videos for years." It was funny because I was already like broken off and couldn't snowboard anymore. Yeah, he was and one of he the was first. Done. Yeah, he was done too. Yeah, but he was one of the first snowboard editors actually doing quite like cool artsy videos. He did the cool. Camp of Champs videos. Yeah. Like that's Camp how Champs, I got like, exposed to him, I think. Up. Yeah, he got sick. That's what made me want to go there. He got sick. His videos. videos. Yeah. I got obsessed with that idea of going to Camp of Champs and I saved like all year. That was a good era. <clears throat> it's kind of um what was I gonna say? It is kind of interesting how 
like back in the day you were just thrown into videography because no one else wanted to film you and now you do it for a living yeah I was like yeah like it was I got my first camera because me and Jordan Glenn and Zach Moorcroft always borrowed my dad's camera from the church because <laughs> uh, my dad's a pastor and we would we would call it the bible cam and uh we would take the we would take the bible cam out and make these horrible videos <laughs> and uh we wanted more control and like not have to borrow the camera every time and so i decided i was gonna get a job at swish la and i worked for like five months until i had the exact amount for the camera and then i left the job bought the camera and went back to staining at my mom's house just <laughs> at my mom and dad's house just being a bum yeah nice um one thing that i've actually found really interesting where i live in toronto i guess it's kind of like the hipster mm. artsy neighborhood if the, if you were to pick one mm. i'm in like the west end but there's this place called the creator class i don't know if you've heard of that i've heard of it and they have big directors and photographers and videographers from all over the place show up and do talks about what their career has been like and how they got there and their approaches and a lot of them our guys who started out doing skate photography and not many snowboard. There's obviously the snowboard world is way smaller than the skateboard world, but so many of these guys came from skateboarding. I think it's kind of like a world where you're just like creative. It's just completely accepted and encouraged. And these guys can just take their pat, their hobbies from when they were little kids and just roll with it. Yeah. I think there was, I think it was really, I think skaters and snowboarders got lucky. The ones that film stuff, because I think we, we're so into filming, you know, ourselves where, you know, the only reason you would own a camera back then, because like now everybody owns a camera, but back then you'd only own a camera to like make home videos, have a business or like, you know, film yourself doing whatever it is you do, like cool stuff, like skateboarders and snowboarders, like especially everybody always wanted to film stuff, which is like weird because soccer players aren't like, get the cam we got to get some sick shots today. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's, it's not, part of the like, sport. spots and like set up and like do all that stuff. Yeah. It's like part of the sport and skating and snowboarding is like getting the shot. At least it was for us. And so you get this skill in getting the shot. And then all of a sudden we move into, we transition into this world. That's like all about the shot. Like everything is about getting the shot. We're in a social media age where it's like, post this, post that, like content this, content that. Before that, like content didn't exist. You had like a display picture on MSN Messenger. Yeah. And that was content. Like there was no <laughs> content. Um, That's such a good point. And like books, you'd have a book or like write a book. You know, you wouldn't have these. It, maybe you had uh, like a website that people went to. Yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky. Maybe, maybe. If you were really early. Yeah, but like that wouldn't even have been all that cool. And then all of a sudden we transition into this, in this age where there's like, it's all about, you know, the shot and all of these skaters and snowboarders have the skill to like, to film stuff because they've learned it all just so that they can, you know, upload a sick little edit. And that's a good point. That's it's like... completely how it happened for me. Like me and Jordan Glenn, we would just sit there editing and editing and editing all the time and... And then Eric, I moved back to London from Barry, and then Eric Raymond, <laughs> shout out to Eric, would like, <laughs> would like sit in and like we would just smash out edits of Boulder Mountain and then like got into making like little films, short little films about snowboarding and stuff. And then it just kept exploding, exploding. But really, it's it wasn't even, maybe it was the videos that were getting popular or maybe it was just the idea of having videos in the first place was just hitting that like, popularity explosion and all ever everybody's watching each other for the first time ever and yeah. so it's like right place right time we're snowboarders and we're like making dope edits and nobody else is making any edits of anything they do where now everybody films everything if you do anything cool if you have like a skill or a talent you've got that on video for sure mm -hmm. i've never thought about it that way but i guess you like living in that world you've seen it because mm. that is exactly how it happened yeah everyone was just shooting first and then the world got really interested in it after. Yeah. Cause like, and you guys were already, by that point, other people are learning how to do it. And you guys are already ahead of the game, really. Yeah, because we can edit and we understand 
shutter speed <laughs> and ISO, <laughs> the ND filters. Yeah, it was pretty basic, but it paid off. I mean, it was I was like nineteen, making snowboard videos. My back was all busted up. I was done snowboarding forever, and I was like just coming to terms with that. My sister, it was summertime, and I had a camera from filming all these snowboard videos, and I was working a landscaping job, and and like her, I don't even know if I was working a landscaping job at the time. Maybe that was a year later, but um. Regardless, uh, she asked me, will you film this wedding that, uh, that I'm, that I'm, uh, officiating because I'm officiating a wedding for my friend and we really want to be able to watch it later. I've never officiated a wedding before. This is hilarious. And I was like, yeah, I'll officiate it. Can they pay me? And they gave me like 500 bucks and I think they gave me like a hundred dollar tip and they were like, go into business doing this. Your video is amazing. We're so happy. And, like, at the time, I didn't even know that wedding films were a thing, really. I was just like, maybe maybe somebody does wedding films. But, I don't know, I got into that and put a Kijiji ad up for, like, 800 bucks a wedding film. And it just launched. Like, 14 people were like, I want a wedding film, I want a wedding film. And I booked all of them, and all of a sudden, I had a job making films. And, like, j- literally, like, overnight. It was like a Kijiji ad, book, 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 book. I had no idea what I was doing. I like went and met all these people at like Tim Hortons or Williams or whatever. (laughs) And like, I'm like, yeah, I can totally do this. And I'm just some snowboard filmer. Not really sure how you would even do it if you were to do it other than like my one time experience, which was pretty meh. (laughs) And, and that's how it all started. And that was 11 years ago. Wow. It's crazy. Man, I remember those days when you were kind of, we were hanging out all the time. Like, we've been good friends for a really long time. Yeah. And we were sitting around and you would just say things like, I know this can be a job. I just don't know how to do it really. Yeah. And lo and behold, it's like completely <laughs> gone full circle. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great living now. It's a great um, career. And, you know, I only have to make wedding films for seven seven, eight months of the year. And then the rest of the time I can kind of do what I need to do. So yeah, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. I remember when you first started doing that, it was a pretty small business at first, but I actually had a conversation with my brother pretty recently that I've been quoting over and over again. Cause I just find it really interesting that he's seeing it this way too. Cause he's very much like went to school, was top of his class. He's an engineer. He's like pretty doing pretty well and he's happy. Yeah but he definitely followed like that kind of a path Uh and you've kind of, and I, I really give snowboarding a lot of credit in my life because it has exposed me to a lot of people who are literally just like you, like Mm -hmm. basically people who are kind of just doing their own thing. I feel like there's a lot of that in boarding. And if I had not maybe like, if I had not really gone down the path of being obsessed with that sport and meeting tons of people and having most of my friends be snowboarders for many years, I don't know if I would have had the way that I think today. And I'm not even an entrepreneur. Like I'm not doing my own thing in the way that you are, but I think that those just thoughts have really helped me in the way that I'm living my own life. But yeah, my brother basically said, you know, I look at some of your buddies who are literally videographers for a living. They're photographers for a living. They take time off whenever they want. They make great money doing all these things. And I just think back at the days and it's not our parents' fault. It's no fault of their own. They just grew up in an era where things were very different. Mm -hmm. And they're also from immigrant parents who kind of, you know, there's a bit of a struggle, you know, they grinded to create the lifestyle. So they, they taught, they were taught and then they taught us that the way to have security and happiness in your life is to go to school, get a nine to five job that's reliable at like a bank or something. And Mm -hmm. then you'll be stoked. And that creative careers were not reliable. Like it was something that was definitely mentioned because I remember like I have a business degree. It's so generic. And there were other things I was considering, and those were things, considerations my parents brought up. Um, like, are you sure you want to do that? Like, you got to look at the jobs that exist in that. And now, and sure, there weren't that many jobs back then in those fields, but all my friends who just ignored those kinds of considerations are literally, I look back and I'm like, my parents, like, it's not their fault, but it's so backwards. Like, you guys are all doing really well because you were 
people who just followed your passions like super deeply mm. and not only did it was an industry of where technology just blew up yeah. but perfect timing yeah but seriously like you're willing to put in the time and the learning to mm. to get ahead when you're really passionate about things because Definitely. you like the process i think that's that's the absolute key though yeah if you're not like hyper passionate about it and you don't have like a super intense personality where you just get like hyper focused on like on what it is that you like if you don't have that I I mean I don't think you can really make it a living but because I don't know because I get so like obsessed with everything yeah, that do. I like like I get so obsessed with anything that I like if I like something and um with filmmaking, I got so obsessed with like how fun it was to go home and rewatch it. It was like it wasn't worth it if it, if you weren't getting it on film. Footy or it doesn't count. <laughs> like it was so funny how obsessed it became. Like it it was a whole part of it. And so, once it became like this, this whole part of the experience, then it was like you know snowboarding for example. Like you go to the hill, you better come back with some footy so you can relive the day. And, like, make a little edit of that day. If it's going to be a good day. Like, if you know all the boys are coming, you know, and it's going to be, like, a sunny day. And, you know, you don't want to waste it. And it would always felt like a waste if we didn't record it. And then that kind of transitioned all across my life where it was like, I need to record this. I need to record this. And I I remember I took two weeks at one point. And I was like, I'm going to record everything for two weeks. My parents were going away. And I had the house to myself and I was like, I'm just going to film everything for two weeks. And I didn't film like constantly recording, but if I did anything like major, like even like major would be like make coffee. I would like any action, any action that was like worth showing. Yeah. I think I even had like a shot of me peeing in there, a shot of me in the shower, like everything that happened, I recorded and I just like, I found it so interesting and fun to do that for whatever reason. And and the, yeah, it just transitioned into, into being like super, super interested in filming anything I could get my hands on. And then the storytelling part of like filming kind of came after, I think I just before just kind of wanted to like get the shot. And then it became like so many people getting the shot that it's like, okay, make it cool. <laughs> how do you make it different? How do you step it up yeah, once everyone else is catching up? Exactly. But yeah, the not going to school thing, I, was, I had such an anti-establishment attitude about kind of everything and like super rebellious. I don't know. If yeah, I remember. Like, yeah, I don't know if it was like super positive, but I was like just anti, like, oh, you're going to school. Why are you wasting your time? Like it was just such a so um opinionated about it and um (laughs) and yeah like it just i i was so dead like i needed to prove that you didn't need to go to school almost it was like because i had talked so much smack i was like i gotta make this work now um no but it's it's funny when you know like you have something that you really like if it could be now it can be anything pretty much um but anything you love can be pretty much like sold (laughs) because you love it so much and people see how much you love it and they they want to buy like that passionate like essence about it because they see you and talk to you about getting it done and all that stuff and they're like oh I want that how do I buy in you know like how do I get into that yeah um I don't know I find that pretty interesting with with like selling video content and stuff like you can get really into other people's stuff like other people's video ideas and projects and like you end up like getting so into it and like just the dream of putting it to reality that they are like okay sold like you want to do this so bad (laughs) like i see it in you you've got what it takes before even like some people will hire you before they even see your work and it's like they just like you're just resonating with them really they well. They can sense the the passion. Yeah. And you are like a really passionate person too. For sure. Those are a couple things that, like in all honesty, um, like you, I've, of all my really close friends, you've probably been someone who's influenced me a lot in a lot of good ways. Because mm. like I said, like I love my parents, but I was raised in a household where things were very black and white um, in certain areas. It was like, 
it's actually really chill now. Yeah, yeah. Like now that I'm adult, I'm an adult. I could literally do whatever I want. Like it's it's really changed. But there was a point, and it was just out of love. Like they were wanted me to. They wanted all of us to like. Not, them to not have to worry about us and us to be happy and be able to fend for ourselves in the real world. But right. being exposed to kind of you telling me things like <laughs> you don't need to go to school, man. <laughs> and I would always have a counter argument because like I was learning really good shit and I. We would have really I knew there was an application to what I was learning. Like, people do need people who learn those things. Yeah, we would have really good arguments. Me, you, and Eric, especially. Yeah, Since yeah, Eric, Eric too. We would, we would, like, just fight, but, like, love it about it. Like, we would love the fight. Yeah, I, it was I, always I fun. We were all just that. voicing our opinions. Yeah, I quite enjoyed that. Um, but no, yeah, like, I've, I've always found, like, your influence to be really good on me. And just, you are such an outside-the-box thinker. Hmm. And... I've always wondered, like, how do you think it was that you created a life? Because, I mean, I kind of know how you did it just from seeing it, but I don't know if you have a way of dissecting it. Like, how did you end up in a life where everything is so intentional? Like, you don't really just do things because someone said anything. Like, you very much think for yourself. And I have thought about it before, about similarities between you and other people I know who live that way. Hmm. I th- I've read a lot about how children who are homeschooled yeah. are taught even, I don't think you were homeschooled for that long, right? But yeah. until grade three, until grade three, like children who are homeschooled, they're just like, they're not programmed. They're just like allowed to think for themselves. And they grow up and they often grow up into adults that are more creative or they're entrepreneurs yeah. There's like a very, there's a lot of studies about that. So I've, I've always thought maybe that was something with, cause you're also like, you can come up with ideas like so well, like even when you're just thinking of puns and stuff, hmm. and I think a lot of people like to foster creativity and they challenge themselves to do that. But I feel like you just have that inherently. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't, as far as intentional, you know, I guess that's cool that you noticed that about me because sometimes I feel quite indecisive when I make decisions and I just, I just make a decision instead of sitting there in that indecisiveness. Uh, Okay. (laughs) So it may come across as intentional, but it's really just like, I need to do things. I need to just like, I, I don't like the state of, of like debating what I should or shouldn't do. Um, so if I like, Oh, is there going to be, waves there like as soon as I think about is there going to be waves like somewhere on the lake when there's wind I'm like hyper focused on it and it'll be so hard to break me from going to find out if there's going to be waves there like because I've thought about it with like that like I'm leaning this way and then I lean that way and I just go full in that's like the art of following your gut too kind of yeah it's like oh I can tell that I want to do this definitely um Yeah, so I think being homeschooled for those early years, but then before that, I was like, I was watching my sister and my brother be homeschooled, and my mom would always, you know, kind of, or I feel like, I don't entirely remember, I I guess, you kind of create your own memories for your childhood, you remember what you, what you decide you're going to remember, which I find quite interesting, but, um, but yeah, I think I, my mom kind of taught us to be, to question things always and like you know if the crowd is going one way you know there's a good chance that the way that they're going isn't right and there's some other way to go um that is better and we were kind of raised on that kind of belief that like society isn't necessarily like secular stuff and just like normal or what seems normal to people isn't always like good and isn't the direction you should go And so I think kind of with that thought in the back of my mind, when I was like released into school, I always kind of questioned things. I never had like a fully like, like, yes, sir, I'm, I'll do what you say kind of attitude with any like of my teachers or any authority or anything like that, which isn't always the best, but I always questioned stuff. And I was always like, I never thought that like, the traditional way of people like, Oh, you've got to participate in the play. Like everybody's participating in the play. I'd be like, no, I don't want to participate in that play. That's stupid. (laughs) And like, 
just, yeah, things like that. Like, oh, you got to go to school all the way to grade 12. And I did that. But like, you got to do your homework and get these good marks. I just thought like, what is this? Like, why, who says, why do you say that? Like, I don't know. It just felt, it felt wrong to me. <clears throat> it felt, uh, it felt more like I wanted to create a life where I could offer a skill or service that would then, you know, I'd, I'd then be that person and all the whitens in my, in my family, like my dad and his brothers and his dad, they'd all created their own businesses. And I think that I, oh. I just like, I had watched them, especially when I was homeschooled and we had a lot of family time and a lot of free time. I would watch them all be these like men of like whatever it is that they do. So my dad was a pastor, which, you know, in a way is quite an entrepreneurial undertaking because you're running a church and there's not really anything for sale. Like you're not really, you're not really providing a, something that you come in and purchase. Like nobody's guaranteed to leave any money behind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very, there's a lot of uncertainty. Right. Just so like entrepreneurship. That's, that's quite a creative, uh, thing to do uh, quite a creative undertaking especially to succeed in and now he's like 25 years in or something to his church and there's thousands of people that go and it's you know watching that process was you know was work watching that like struggle was like impressive to me Mm -hmm. and and then all of his brothers and his dad they all had awesome businesses and even like their sons had like had really cool businesses and I knew that that's what people should do. And like, I had formed that opinion. I was like, that's what people should do. Like, why are we in school learning about all this stupid stuff when we could just like, I could just become, you know, like a guy that makes ropes, like my grandpa or like a guy that makes furniture, like my cousin Blaine. And I don't know. It just became so obvious that that's how you should do it. But I had no idea what it was that I was going to do at all until my sister asked me to film that wedding. So, so yeah, I was definitely lost, but I was good at snowboarding. So I just followed that <laughs> and just obsessively, you know, like I was saying, just like got laser focused on snowboarding. I was like, I got to be better than other people. I got to, you know, get what everybody wants. I don't know. I, that's so motivating for a young guy. You just like want to be good at something and noticed and like, look at me. I'm doing something and I'm doing it very well. That's yeah. really, that's really what motivated me. It was weird, but, um, yeah, I got really good at snowboarding, broke my back and then found filmmaking and the filmmaking thing was just like, again, it was like, I'm just going to get laser focused on this uh -huh. and just film, you know, bees on flowers at night in my mom's garden or like, you know, anything, just anything, film anything. And, uh, like a day in the life, a week in the life, two weeks in the life. I did three weeks one time of just like taking my camera around and filming all the moments. And just doing that made me skilled in using the camera and then kind of got into the art of like storytelling later on with the wedding thing. I think I kind of had to keep stepping up my game because I wanted to keep, you know, making better films than other people making wedding films so that how can I make a better one than them what can I do and used you know creativity to kind of do my own thing with that and you know at the same time I was doing all kinds of other videos as well like promo videos for any kind of little business that would that would hire me as like a 20 year old or whatever and um and then my dad took me to India uh, to make a film because he's like I want to make or I want you to make a documentary in India of the organization that I work with, um, that builds children's homes and hospitals and all this stuff. Um, will you come and I'll buy you a brand new Sennheiser wireless microphone. <laughs> it's like an $800 mic and he's going to pay for my flight. And like, and you got a crazy adventure and like take me on this opening experience. Right. But at the time it wasn't even like, it didn't even seem like, Oh, this is going to be like a crazy dad and son adventure. It just seemed like, Oh, it's something that like, yeah, I can do this. Let's do this for sure. And it, it, I don't know. I kind of went not thinking so much about how impactful it would be like 
way down the road when you think back about that kind of stuff and you're like, oh, that was an insane three weeks. You know, like it was, yeah. it's crazy in, in hindsight, like how much it means when you like, I don't know, like when you look back at something and you're like, wow, that was really, that three weeks really set a new trajectory for how things were going to come and what ha- what would have happened had that not happened, you know? Yeah. It's so cool how that stuff works. So I went with my dad and made this film about all these, um, these children's homes and hospitals. And we went all over India and met all kinds of people and super humbling, like super humbling. And yeah, just seeing how everybody lives and, and getting to know people and making friends over there. And then coming back to our so-called reality that you've just found out isn't reality for majority of the world. And then you just kind of like weirdly sit with that for a while and try to digest it. Yeah. Um, So that was, yeah, that was a part of the creative journey for sure. I still, wanting to go to India has been really something that I've thought about for a long time. I feel like I've kind of put eye-opening adventures on hold at the moment, Mm -hmm. which... (coughs) Yeah. I mean, I guess that's just a choice of mine. It doesn't have to be that way. But, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen that. And I want that, like, crazy experience. Basically, like, because I feel like I've seen what it has done for you. But just when when we went to Costa Rica, that was really, for me, the first time I literally saw what other people live like everywhere. Yeah. And it is so enlightening. It's so enlightening. Yeah. And it... <clears throat> it makes you feel good and bad at the same time. It's a, it's quite an interesting feeling. Um, yeah. But traveling, yeah, going on that trip with my dad was like, oh, I love traveling. I want to see more. And that set it all up. You know, had I not gone on that trip with my dad, I may have never started to travel. Because I, you know, I remember when my sister got malaria when I was like super young. And she was living in Africa. And she got sick with malaria. And I was like, I... I don't think I'll ever go to Africa. That sounds like way too dangerous. And then like, sure enough, <laughs> now I've been yeah. to Africa twice, um, to like the most dangerous place I can find. Um, which it's so weird how, how things change. And when you say, oh, I could never do that. Like it's, you have no idea what you're going to be like in a few years. We change so fast and so much. Um, and we're constantly like becoming, I mean, if you're trying, <laughs> you're constantly like working on yourself and improving. And I think if you have as much time as I do alone, like, you know, working on these films or sitting up in my apartment, I'm just like, well, everybody else is working. And I'm like, I, I don't even feel like I'm working because I'm just at home on my computer doing what I've done since I was 15 years old after high school, making videos of us skating and snowboarding, you know, like nothing's, changed as far as like what I love to do and what now I'm doing for a job except for the fact that nobody else is around (laughs) yeah because everybody's gone to work (laughs) and so I've just like had a lot of time to try to self-improve and think about things and expand um, my thought process and all this stuff and it's had me look at my past experiences and realize how yeah how impactful just the little things can be it's cool That alone time does really good things for the mind, eh? Big time. I remember I really didn't really, I didn't appreciate it, even quite recently. I think it has really been living in Toronto where it's hard to get that. It literally is overstimulating there, man. Do you Um, find that you, when you get the alone time, you're like really looking forward to it like if you're driving home and you know that you're gonna be alone for a couple of hours and you're like yes oh yeah and something interrupts it and you're just like no (laughs) like you're longing for that alone time now whereas before it would have been such like a burden no not alone time yeah yeah I really seek it out and I've been making kind of like rules for myself to get more of it like Mm -hmm. blocking out time um I've learned what I would mean, you do with your alone time if you could have two hours a day? Two hours a day? Yeah. Um, I would meditate for a half hour. I would start it with a meditation, probably journal for a little bit. And then literally just something that, some kind of creative passion. Um, I was telling you about that 
kind of interesting retreat I went to last week. Yes. And I've been feeling so much like myself ever since that. It was like a really introspective experience. Mm-hmm. And I've just been spending time writing again. I, Sure, I've been creating content through the podcast, but I really love writing. Mm-hmm. And I always, as soon as I started writing, I was like, I'm going to write a book someday. Like, I'm going to do it. And I've kind of just been so stimulated in the city. I mean, I'll just talk about the whole thing I was telling you earlier. Mm-hmm. When we mentioned Should, it. Yeah. Like, I truly was living in London a couple of years ago, pretty depressed for a little while. And I came across the Jordan Peterson book. And it kind of teaches you, you know, how do you have more confidence and belief in yourself by giving yourself a reason to believe in yourself? So I decided in that moment, I'm going to get a job at an ad agency. I'm going to start making all these dreams of mine happen. And I've always seen those as stepping stones to get to some just more freedom. Like I don't actually want to be a nine to five life or living downtown where my whole life is about wearing a suit to work and being in board meetings. Like I don't want that. I want the freedom of experiencing that and being able to take that to something, a world that I love. And I had lost that. I honestly lost that. Like in Toronto, like it's so easy to get caught up. You're surrounded by people who are career focused and that's really cool. It's a good influence, people who care. But I got so lost. And mm. yeah, and I just kind of have like realized like I like creating content. I like having podcasts like this. I like meeting people mm. and using this as an excuse to just branch out and I like I'm so fortunate with this podcast that I always get to meet really dope people. And it's mm. so exciting. And so I've just really, yeah, my alone time I spend kind of chilling, like just being present and just like relaxing, being like just kind of enjoying it. Whereas a couple months ago I would be relaxing and I might be literally beating myself up thinking I could be doing something so that I, and I just got a big promotion at work, but I would still, even right after that promotion, I would still be sitting around thinking, shit, what what can I do tonight so that the next promotion I get is equally as large as this and my salary takes another big jump and like I was already just and this is when I was I was talking to Brooke on on FaceTime and she was like, "Man, like you can just decide to be in that state now." Like mm-hmm. and then I realized like I really just need to reconnect with such a it sounds so I have this like weird guard up when things get too hippie sounding, but those guys have like, they're pretty wise sometimes, but it's like, I really just have been taking time to chill and just reconnect with literally like who I am. Yeah. I like being creative. I like having really fun, valuable experiences with my friends. Mm -hmm. I value just freedom. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't like, I don't actually want to have like, if I had a bazillion dollars in the bank, I would still go and buy like a little Subaru hatchback, you know, like I would literally do that. (laughs) I I don't know. I just feel like I really got caught up, but yeah. I mean, on that note, before we get too far along, I wanted to talk to you about what you're doing in Africa. Um, I know you got involved with a charity and there's some pretty cool things happening there, but I just kind of, I remember you just happened to go down there to shoot a video. Someone hired you. And, or I don't know if they did hire you, if it was volunteer right off the start. Yeah, I, I could tell you about it. Okay. So eight years ago, like right after I had gone to India with my dad, I was at a beer pong tournament, <laughs> which I won with my brother. And, um, and I met a guy named Jeff Lang and Jeff Lang, uh, he was mentioning that he's working in Africa on this project, um, this agricultural project. I barely remember our conversation other than kind of making a fool of myself being like oh I could come and make a video and like yeah it'll be amazing and um fast forward like you know to last March and uh, I think it was last March maybe February and um and you know obviously my life had changed like crazy um I'd gone to gone to India I kind of let that sink in I've traveled to I think 23 countries between now and then. And, um, you know, I got a lot of like life experience through all of that. And I saw a lot of life and the way that people lived and I experienced all kinds of different cultures all over the world. And, you know, I really devoted a lot of time and effort and finances to that. I just wanted this kind of global experience. Um, 
And that went on for like four or five years, just chasing waves and surfing my guts out. And, you know, when all that was said and done, I, you know, I got home and I, you know, I started to like kind of, I guess, rest after like four or five, I think it was five years that I traveled like crazy. And um, when I did that, you know, I, I stopped drinking. I, I didn't drink for like seven months. And, you know, I, I was just super chill, super like waking up at five in the morning, really relaxed. And I met this Jeff guy and, and he said, let me go back a bit. So I, I started editing a video for a friend named Andrew Parr. He had just gotten back from Africa. And so I'm editing this video with him. He's sitting beside me. We're working on this video and, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm like, man, I want to go to Africa. This looks amazing. He's like, you should go. You should absolutely go. And then I'm like laying in bed. I'm thinking like, man, I got to go to Africa. Like something is pulling me to Africa. I feel like uninspired to film anything around here now that I've seen Andrew's footage that he shot on his iPhone that was like felt like it was better than anything I've ever filmed I was like oh my gosh I gotta not actually but like I I gotta go to Africa I felt like so compelled and then the next morning I wake up and I get a message from my buddy Kyle Lyons it's it's uh, Jeff Lang's uh, nephew uh, the guy who was having the beer pong tournament I haven't talked to Kyle in probably a year at the time and uh and he's like, hey, man, I like, I want to connect you with, with my uncle Jeff. He, he wants to talk to you about potentially doing some video stuff in Africa. And this is literally like the next morning when I wake up, it's Sunday morning, it's like 9 a.m. And I get this message and it's like, Jeff wants to take you to Africa. <laughs> and then, the night before I was like, I want to go to Africa. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to Africa while I was falling asleep. It was crazy. Wow. It was so cool, man. And so that's like sometimes I wonder about man. Like I'm getting goosebumps. All my hairs like stood up, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is nuts!" I'm meeting this guy immediately. I call him, and we meet, and like he's like, "What are you doing in two weeks?" After we talked for like 45 minutes, totally caught up. I told him where I was at, um, you know, and he's like, "Oh man, like come with me. Let's go. Let's make a video about." this project that I'm working on, which is, I was about to learn a whole lot about it, which I barely knew anything about at the time. And I was just like, I'm down. So I went out, I started getting all my shots for like the next 11 days. I was just like getting all my needles. We got a a fast track, um, visa from this big company, um, that, that was able to support, uh, Jeff and this, this kind of endeavor end up. And yeah, so I got my visa, like really fast for South Sudan and we basically just got on the plane and took off and went and I like still barely had any idea what I was getting in for and then he's like oh I'll tell you about it on the plane you know holy shit <laughs> you had no idea what well and so for the, those 14 days I obviously like jumped online like any sane man would do and researched everything I could about South Sudan I wrote like like eight pages in my journal about like or in my notebook about like facts about South Sudan, like the population, like this many people are on UN aid, you know, this is the main organizations that are like, this is the state of the war because they're in the middle of a crisis, uh, like a civil war. And, um, and so I'm, you know, I'm learning all about it. And th- the deeper I dive into it, like the more like, oh man, this is like a horrible, horrible situation. Um, not that I'm in, but that these people are in. And I became like so empathetic towards these people that I was like, I was just so excited to go and make this film and like do what I could do. And, you know, we went down there, we spent, spent only five days there. We had, as soon as we got off the plane, we've got like guys with like, we've got security, like guys with guns, like marching us off and like into our van and rolling with us everywhere we go. And like, every time I would film anything, I've got like, I've got like an armed guard with me when I'm pulling at my camera, it was, it was pretty intense. And we made some, we made some films around, um, what they're doing over there. So they have a, they have an agricultural program with 2,400 acres of land and they can expand to 22,000. So they have permission from the government to use this land. But the issue is there's all kinds of, not the issue, but like a situation of that is there's all kinds of people living on this land that haven't been bonding with the other people that live on that land. And now you're trying to bring everybody together in like more of like a community fashion to 
take part in this agricultural program. So it's like, we can all get jobs, we can all learn how to farm, we can all drive tractors and get like qualified or certified to drive tractors and fix them. This, uh, this amazing program and our kids can go to school. Um, but we have to be friends. And, you know, so that's, that's a really hard thing to, to implement when you're, you know, you're, these, this country has been in war for 54 years before they separated and became so Sudan, they were Sudan and they were fighting to become so Sudan. And a year after they became their own country, they went back at it. And it's been like a Dinka versus newer war where like two different tribes are basically just killing each other for being different. It's, it's horrible. And you've got like government super, like not government superpowers, but you've got these government armies that are fighting these wars and playing this stuff out. And so that it's really like, everybody's really standoffish and it's really hard to kind of get anybody to work together and rally together. So what they've done over the 13 years before I showed up is quite remarkable in this community. They've really brought everybody together and they've really, um, created a, a, quite a nice community within a very hostile environment. And that comes with a lot of challenges for sure. But my goal on my way there, I realized was to tell the story of this, this relationship between, you know, the Canadians, the Israeli partners that are helping the Canadians and, um, and the, the community itself over there. And now I'm thinking like, even like the community itself, that's, that's a huge story in itself. Like all the different moving parts within the community, how they're all getting along. There's like 22 different chiefs. Oh Um, wow. Yeah. It's really, it's really an interesting dynamic over there. And, and yeah, so, so learning all about that for five days and filming everything I possibly could about that was an insane experience. Um, came home and, you know, that really resonated with me. Like, really. It was, like, defining. Yeah, I remember, just want to interject here. Yeah. I remember you came home, and that was when I lived around the corner here. And we hung out, and you were like, man, I don't, I feel like I don't even know what's going on. I've just been in this, like, weird state of, like, almost nausea, just kind of thinking about, just processing what I saw. And... Yeah, I was definitely shook up. It was, yeah, and I still, I still am still shook up about it all. Um, but I want to keep going back because there's so much work to be done. But I went back, fast forward a year after making that documentary, making, oh yeah, no, we won't go a year full forward. So I made a documentary for this organization based on the footage that we got on that trip. And then I ended up remaking the website. Um, we redid all the logos, me and, uh, Ryan Osmond and, um, we, yeah, we read the website, me and Faye, and um, there's just a whole bunch of effort put into it. I, I got put on the board. They all, the board, like, nominated me onto the board or however you get onto a board. I don't know. They all asked me to be on it, and I said yes, and I've just taken on all of the media and kind of, like, social media aspect of it and, like, the face of it because before that it wasn't, it didn't have one. It was just this quiet thing that these amazing farmers and non-farmers in London, Ontario have been doing. It's called CDES because it's, it's a short for Canadian Economic Development Assistance for South Sudan. And, um, yeah, they've been over there for 13 years. Jeff has gone like 21 times, I believe. And, you know, it definitely doesn't get any easier. I bet. Um, going back, but we went back and, um, we went back nine months later or 11 months later, something like that. And, um, I, I wanted to make these two new, um, two new kind of stories around clean water and the lack of it. And another one on like the, the school specifically on one student who had, a an interesting story, kind of, they all have insane, interesting stories compared to like what we are used to or what's normal to us. So no matter who I ask, out of any of the students, all of their stories sound just unbelievable to us. But I found one girl who was, you know, willing to 
tell us her story and introduce her to us to her family. And, you know, she goes to school and that was a um, super like special experience to, to get to do that. And, um, and yeah, and then the clean water one that we did, it, it ended up just kind of taking me back and taking me aback and being like, you know, these people don't have access to clean water. And I think that there's something that we can do about it. So we kind of got everything in line to build a clean water pipeline because we already have a big pipeline, a five kilometer pipeline that runs from the Nile River to our farmland where we um, have the 2,200 acres where we're farming corn and rice and um, onions and all kinds of other stuff. Um, it's, it's an amazing farm and uh, and yeah, tons of produce is coming off of it and a lot of people are a lot of people around are using our produce. Um, but there's this big, thick, foot foot thick uh, pipeline that runs this five kilometers. And so the plan with the clean water pipeline is to tap into that, run it into a uh, filtration treatment kind of container that's supplied by this company. I don't know the name of it off, off the top of my head. Um, the company sends the container and it has everything kind of built in and ready. So you basically just hook it up, run the pipe at the other side. It's going to get clean so long as your treatment process is um, you know, up to date or whatever. So I, yeah. I really don't know how water gets treated. And I imagine I'm going to learn a whole lot about that in the near future. But, um, but anyway, the, that's the, the plan is to run this four kilometer pipeline to six different stations within the community and provide clean water, um, at least access to clean water through, through that. And, uh, instead of, because everybody is drinking the Nile there, like literally the Nile river, yeah. no one's boiling it. They're just scooping it up. Like taking they, home and drinking it from that. Are they getting sick from Very it? much that's, so. So that's one of the main problems. Very much so. 98% yeah. of all the guinea worm cases in the whole world are in South Sudan. Holy shit. 98%. Wow. So like these people are getting worms like crazy from just drinking that water. Um, and all kinds of other medical just problems. So we have a, we have a health facility there, like a medical clinic there at the school that's open three days a week with like a doctor and a prenatal nurse and a couple of their staff. And, um, we distribute vaccines and medicine from there. Um, but the cases that come in just time after time after time is just water related, water related, water related, water related. Yeah. And it's the one thing that it, it, was... it just really stuck with me. And I, I really think that, that, we can do something about it. So we had a look at the funds and we realized how much we have and how much we need. And I created this video that kind of highlights the issues and we started a GoFundMe campaign and we're, you know, we're at 14,000 right now, 14,100 or something, 13,000 on the campaign. Someone else has donated a thousand outside of the campaign. And um, we want to get to a hundred thousand and that'll guarantee us pretty much four years of treatment like consecutive treatment. And we're hoping over that course of four years, we'll be able to, um, like kind of ease the costs, uh, into the farm's budget and the profit that the farm makes through, uh, selling the crops slowly use the farm to hopefully pay for the clean water project. That's the plan right now. Um, okay, cool. And it's kind of, the plan is, is still moving around a bit, but, uh, the, the project, like the, the financing that we need is, pretty much the same so okay we're figuring out the logistics of you know how we would dig it when we would dig it what time of year what would happen during the uh, few months where our pump for the field isn't running you know would we get a secondary pump or would we pay to run the big pump you know there's a lot of logistics yeah um but to get the ball rolling was was something that i really wanted to do because i really wanted to uh to, you know, just see a difference over there. And it's a small dent, but it's something that at least I can do. Yeah, dude, I don't know if that's a small dent. Hmm. Like one of the, I mean, I know you're kind of hard on yourself with that sort of thing, but hmm. this is the one thing I love about this charity and from what I've heard about it is that it's literally like an initiative that is directly helping people in one of the most poor places on the entire planet. Yeah. Um, it's not some giant corporate charity, 
which is still doing good, but they have overhead costs left, right, and center by the time the money gets down to people. Like, who knows what's even happening? Yeah, um, like, I'm the one that's handling this entire GoFundMe and, like, the funds behind it. And, you know, it's coming directly into the GoFundMe and directly out to the Clean Water Project. And, like, everybody in the board is donating their own money into it. And, you know, we're definitely as, like, grassroots as it gets. And I can... I can hardly take credit for it because it's really, you know, the persistence of Jeff Lang and, and the rest of the board that's been on it the whole time. You know, I'm the new guy, but um, it's quite an honor to, to get to fit in with this group of guys. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I mean, like, I, I guess, like, I just want to say, like, thanks for being one of the people out there who actually goes and does this stuff. Hmm. I think one of the things that... I'm going to put the donation link for the GoFundMe in the description. Yeah, it'd be cool. Just check out the video anyway, if if anything, and just see yeah. what's going on over there with uh, with my new friends. They're, uh, they're living in quite an interesting way. Yeah, definitely. I, like, definitely have admired seeing you do this, just because, you know, I think one of the biggest ways to... Just being up to something bigger than yourself is so important in life. I think, like, you really... Like, I don't really know what the meaning of life is other than to connect with other people and make a meaning in other people's lives. Yeah. And I kind of think that that's what it is. I've been Um, hearing on repeat, I feel like, that to volunteer your time is like, when you, when you volunteer your time, it, you're almost guaranteeing that you're going to live longer. Like people that, that live the longest, you know, they don't stop moving. They don't stop volunteering. They're always involved in like anything that they can be. And I'm not saying just go get involved in anything you can be, but I think finding one thing that you can really like do something that has not much to do with yourself other than like whatever skill that you have that you can put towards it. Even if you don't feel like you have skills, like if you can hand out leaflets at the door or whatever, you know, like that's going to feel good at the end of the day. There's so much to say about that kind of stuff. So and I, I'm not the one to say it. Like, I'm the one that's hearing it, that's trying to respond to what I'm hearing. Um, but there's a lot there's a lot of people that, that preach that, that, that say, you know, you've got to volunteer your time. You've got to do something for other people. Yeah, I've read... Uh, I feel like this statement is almost, like, back to being, like, self-oriented. But nonetheless... It's literally what I was saying before, but mm-hmm. one of the keys to be... To happiness, and happiness is one of the keys to living longer stressful hormones literally come from negative thoughts Mm. and they shape your entire physiology and your health so happy thoughts literally do the opposite i think people forget that health comes from thoughts in a very powerful way but happiness and exercise yeah and exercise not not actually exercise not actually exercise movement just movement in general Mm -hmm. walking yeah using your body using your body to use yeah you need to yeah. If you don't do that, you're screwed. Absolutely. But that, like, I've I've been feeling quite stressed about the South Sudan stuff. It, it is quite stressful. It's a new territory for me. I'm uh, I'm super unfamiliar with uh, with trying to like you know, not run a charity, but like do big, big things in a charity and try to like run initiatives and like just just figuring it all out is quite is quite stressful so i've been just jumping on my bike and just smashing the exercise because yeah. i need that that clarity that that you get from it yeah like there's something about being completely burnt out physically like your energy is just completely depleted that you really learn something in your mind like you really oh, yeah. start to dive into parts of your mind that you're not you you have almost no access to in a chair you know, you, you're at the end of like a, a long, long bike ride, like five, six hour bike ride. And you're, your thinking is 100% different than when you got on that bike. Even if you're like, oh, I'm strong. This is great. You're like, you're crazy at that point. Yeah. You know, you've lost it. You're on some like weird mindset and you'll find, you'll realize that because if you talk to anybody right after you're finished a ride like that, they talk to you differently. They respond to you differently. Like there's something weird about you in that moment. <laughs> So I find like going there has been super helpful with, with all the uh, like kind of added stress that the, like trying to do this GoFundMe has added. It's, um, 
it's amazing the uh, effectiveness of getting on my bike. Like it's almost like I'm I crave it now. I I I'm I want to be on my bike all the time. Um, and it's like this cool escape for my, for my mind that I can go to. And I, I guess it's probably like meditation, but I'm so obsessed with like being productive that I want to be, even if I'm meditating, I want it to be a productive meditation or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm like, okay, I need to like burn my legs while I'm thinking or like, you know, it, <laughs> it's so weird. I like, I'm, I really am trying to, uh, get better at sitting and doing nothing also. Yeah. Yeah. I get that because I, I think that there's a whole different kind of access to a whole different other part of your brain by doing that. So if I could master both the excessive amounts of energy burning and the, uh, the stillness, complete basically. lack of energy yeah. burning. Yeah. I think if I could harness both of those, I would, I would have a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is one of the things about meditation is that I mean, it is hard to get into, but it gets easier. Everyone kind of forgets that. It gets a lot easier. But also, people kind of have... I, I'm totally... This is, like, why I held off for years. Like, I've been reading about this stuff for years, and I never really meditated. But <laughs> it's like you get more productivity out of your day mm. in general, like 100%, by taking a little chunk at the start to meditate. So, so for... it, it's like you you're you're going to be more productive by focusing on keeping your mind well and sharp and focused and calm. So for a noob like me, what would be the first half hour attempt? Like what would it look like? How would I, how would I go about just starting? Um, so that's, there's kind of the misconception that meditation is just, you have to not be thinking to relax your brain. Right. It's not about that. It's not about turning off your brain. It's about mastering the art of focus and so you pick one thing yeah like you you find an anchor which is like the way the wind like let's say you're outside in the park and it's windy Mm -hmm. your anchor will be the wind hitting your face Mm -hmm. a lot of people do it as the breath is the anchor so your mind is going to wander even expert meditators their mind is wandering that does not mean that you're meditating wrong but the art is just catching that and realizing oh shit i'm thinking again let me just focus on the breath and by doing that you're sharpening your ability to focus in real life. So basically you just and sit there and repeat over and over and over. Think about the wind. Think about the wind. Yeah. You're just trying to like literally focus on the sensations of breathing or focus on the sensations of something. Hmm. A lot of people do a body scan where they focus on the feeling in their feet and then their calves and their knees hmm. and they just do that. Um, but in doing that, you're putting yourself in the present and you're, kind of ignoring the chatter in the back of your mind and thoughts are completely habits they're they're totally habitual negative thinking is literally a pattern and humans can change their patterns and change their habits so that's really what it all comes down to you're creating the habit of being in the present and letting the chatter kind of like sit in the background and not even pay attention to it Hmm. because a lot of us live through the considerations in the back of our mind you know we literally sit there and there's all these considerations popping into our head. Right. And that's what feeds your anxiety and that's where your stress what anxiety and... literally is. You know, I used to really suffer from anxiety. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, Just like, what would be the outcome of that hypothetical situation? Oh, but what if it went like that? Oh, but what about this? Yeah. Oh no. But what about that? And then all of a sudden you're, terrified of a hypothetical situation that isn't even real that you just thought of. Yeah. Then you're literally, you're living in your considerations and you're not living from your own decisions Hmm. because decisions and considerations are totally different. Absolutely. Cool. I think that's a pretty sweet note to end on. Cool, man. Well, thanks for having me on here. It was uh, was good to chat for a few minutes. Yeah. I'm pumped. We could finally do this one. Me too, man. Me too. It was good. It was really fun. (laughs) 